you're on. Okay. Hey, Phil. Uh, it's really cool to be back with you, by the way. I was, we were talking before and I'll continue this conversation we were having about sports team loyalties and like, who do you choose to root for? And as of this year, no, as of last year, I finally decided to choose what sports team I was going to be rooting for rather than have it brought on by, you know, who my father used to root for or who I root, rooted for as a kid. Because there's a certain stage at which you recognize the team really kind of doesn't care about you. They have no connection to you except for the geographic location of where you happen to be and whether or not you're going to buy their merch and their tickets to their games. Now, I was a lifelong Oakland Raiders fan. I had grown up with the Raiders. I lived in the Bay Area, lived in Oakland, and um, they had great teams in the 70s, and it was all good. But eventually, the Oakland Raiders packed up and moved to Los Angeles. And I moved to Los Angeles too, not because of them. And as a result, I wound up continuing to root for the Raiders. And then they moved back to Oakland and I thought, well, that's their rightful place. That's where they ought to be. And so I continued to root for the Raiders, but then they moved to Las Vegas and there was something different about that. There was something about that that just felt like, you know what? I don't really feel like I need to chase this team all over the country, continuing to, to be loyal to them. Instead, I decided I was going to choose who I was going to be loyal to. And I decided on the Detroit Lions because I just absolutely loved their the culture they were building out there. And I really loved the, uh, the, the fact that they were all doing it together. The players, the coaches, the management, the ownership all seemed to be on the same playbook, which is nobody is expecting us to achieve greatness here, but we're going to build it by being together in this thing. It was a, you know, they had... They had this quarterback, Jared Goff, who was a very promising quarterback, but he had been cast off by the L.A. Rams in a trade. And Detroit said, you know what? Ride or die. You're our guy. And he turned in towards the end of the season, turned in very good performances. And the defense was was really starting to pick up. And I just admired that they were building something and they all seemed to love each other. And the coach was just fantastically devoted to his players and they decided they were going to be scrappy. And when they won the, the last game of the season against the green Bay Packers, keeping the Packers out of the playoffs, I was so impressed that it was working. This, this team spirit, this devotion to one another, it was working. The process mattered. It wasn't just bringing in a murderer's row of whatever talent, the best money could buy. It was a team thing, and that just spoke to me. And so I decided I was going to root for the, pa the Lions, even though I have no connection to them, at least spiritually I do. And I've decided now that's going to be my jam. I'm not going to root for a team except unless their values reflect my own. So loyalty has its limits, huh? Think about it. What, what loyalty do I owe them if they're going to pack up and move? What, how is that loyal to me? Uh, you, you know, I mean, I feel no obligation to, if they're going to move, then draw your own fans from your own geographical area. You know what? I'm done. And, uh, I, so there you go. Yeah. Well, so I remember when the 49ers traded Joe Montana, 49ers oh, were my team. And now be, by the way, I'm from just North of green Bay. So by rights, I should be a Packer fan, but unfortunately we didn't get to watch the Packers because they're always blacked out. They sucked yeah. when I was growing up. Like in the 80s, the Randy Wright, uh, you know, uh, Don Mikowski, uh, Lindy Infante, Packers, mm -hmm. Forrest Gregg, Anthony Dilweg, they were terrible. So we never got to see them on TV. We'd watch Packer pregame, 86, with my cousin Bill Jarts, and then we'd be foisted upon us, Cowboys, and then Niners, and right. the Steelers. That's all we yeah. got to watch. Because, we, you know, in Monday Night Football, we'd be like, oh, who's that team? We'd get somebody totally new. But as soon as San Francisco traded away Joe, I will. I told myself, I will no longer be a team fan. I will be a fan of just the uh, just the players that yeah. I love. So I still love Jerry Rice. I actually, big fan, I was a big fan of Steve Young. Ronnie Lott went to the Raiders. That made me want to cry, right? That was horrible when Lott well, went so to the Raiders. Well, so did Rice. Yeah, Rice ended up his career there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He still had, what he had, like seven or eight touchdowns his last year. Or no, he didn't end up there. He ended up in Seattle, I want to say. Oh, okay. I think wow. that's where he ended up. But yeah, but yeah, to your point, I mean, he was still good, but it wasn't the same. 
well, it Phil, wasn't the same. You're too young to remember. There was a time when players spent their whole careers at places. And the Oakland A's were like that. When I was watching the Oakland A's as a kid, I mean, it was year after year. It was Sal Bando and Vita Blue and, and uh, you know, Juan Marichal. And, I mean, it was the same players year after year. So you felt quite loyal to them because it was your team. But free agency, and I, I don't begrudge athletes free agency. When you play a game, say, for example, like football, you are limiting your lifespan with the damage. That's a collision sport. And so you are pouring your heart, soul, and body into that sport. So if you want to get as much money as you can, God bless you, you do it. But what it means is um, we're not in this together the way it used to be. And I suppose, you know, there's no holding it back, Phil. It, it is what it is. But that means that I have no social contract with, with the Oakland Raiders anymore, who are now the Las Vegas Raiders. The social contract I have is who do I want to see win and why? And I want to see a team that is a team and not merely a collection of highly paid racehorses to do what they are paid to do. I want to see people fighting against the odds to demonstrate that teamwork in the end will beat talent. And belief means something. And uh, I, I, that, I think, is one of the lessons, one of the great lessons of sport, actually, is that talented teamwork will beat talent. Um, and you may have heard my story about the 1980 Olympics. Well, you know, it's the, it's the famous story of the miracle on ice. Miracle on ice. It, was a, it was a demonstration. Herb Brooks knew, I can't beat the Soviets nor the Finns on talent. I can't. They're, they're professionals. I have college kids. So what I can do is change the game we play. And I'm going to change the rules in a way by making it not about talent by making it about the ferociousness and cohesion of teamwork. And I think there's a wonderful lesson there for business. And uh, what is that lesson? That if we bind our fates together, and that includes management, and that includes ownership, they have to be willing to repay loyalty with loyalty. And I think we're, we're in an age now where people have forgotten their noblesse oblige. They have forgotten the, the loyalty they owe the people that helped get them to where they are. There's a, there's a, a, a rather pronounced amnesia um, in this day and age, I think. So, so did that, I, I agree with you, by the way. I think they're absolutely, most companies have that amnesia, selective amnesia, if you will, right? What got us there won't get us there. You know, Marshall Goldsmith's great book, or really Jack Welch, we must whack the bottom 10%. Every yeah. year, Chainsaw All Dunlap, you know, all, all oh, those uh, oh folks, you know, Lee Iacocca, all of all of that from the 80s that bled over, continued through until now where, you know, we see all the tech companies, they're at record profits and yet record layoffs. It's like, how yeah, does I mean, that work? Well, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, it's a political issue at this point because, and it's difficult to speak about objectively. I will say that in my own experience, there is no greater joy than victory in a team sport rather than an individual achievement. And I almost, not really, but I almost feel sorry for people that win a gold medal in an individual sport because the, yes, they've won their gold medal and it was exclusively, and they, they accept you know, ownership of the fact that it was their performance that earned them that gold medal. But they won't have the advantage that say the players on that 1980 hockey team had, which is even today, they can phone one another up and relive the joy of that moment. Whereas somebody who won a, a, an Olympic medal in swimming in 1964, just who are they going to call? There's nobody that can share the elation, that can return to that very moment, that can bring it from the past and bring it right into the present and feel it all over again. And imagine what it must have been like to build a company like Hewlett Packard and for, for the core crew to be able to look years later and phone one another up and say, do you remember when we were operating out of a garage? Do you remember what that was like? And uh, now, as you say, there's this impulse to just whack the bottom 10% as a, I don't think the impulse is to keep everybody in terror that they're about to lose their jobs if they don't produce. But, you know, that's an, that was an old Soviet thing. 
you know, we're the the beatings will continue until morale improves. Um, so that they have those troops whose very job is to shoot people that are retreating. There's a, there's a that's a function in the former Soviet army and now in the current version. They they have to shoot people that are fleeing because they are there. The, there's a complete loss of social contract. So, so that's not the way the manager saying you. <laughs> I'm saying it robs even the management, even the ownership. It robs them of a joy. They're not aware that they might be experiencing. Yeah, no, I, I for sure it does. For sure it does. I I know when I've been on great teams, I feel like I'm on a pretty darn great team now, right, right now. That's good. And I feel super fortunate for that because it's one of the reasons why I jump back from just doing my own thing to being part of a team again, because I wanted that feeling. It's yeah. tough to call yourself. You know, when I, when I hit FaceTime and nobody is answering, it's uh, kind of lonely. It's kind of, kind of lonely. And, and so with that, you know, I, I think sometimes though that we, we run into people that are takers as opposed to people that are givers, you know, Adam Grant wrote give and take great book, you know, all about that, but yeah, but let's talk about that a little bit because that's kind of where we left off last time we chatted about some giving and some taking and maybe even some matching. So where, what's, uh, you know, what's your experience, Neil? I, I'm guessing you're a giver. Have you been taken advantage of? Uh, yeah, certainly, of course. But um, but I've also experienced uh, both relatively recent and in the far past, I've experienced givers where you really did want to, you know, that phrase, they'll say like, oh, I'd run through a brick wall for them or, you know, the, the, the great managers will feed that impulse in you. Not, they won't do it in a Machiavelli way. They'll do it because that's just how they are. And I had uh, Scott Gilbert, who I worked for at Sachi and Sachi, used to have this, this quality of always, you always knew he cared how you were doing. Um, even before I worked for him at this advertising agency, I was kind of, I was going a little, I was going a little crazy from, not from overwork, but from too many hours and not enough sleep. Um, you get, you get weird. And so I was, our, our office hours unofficially were nine to five. Right, let me rephrase that. Officially they were nine to five, but our unofficial office hours were 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, all you ever had time for was going home and getting just enough sleep to come back in. And I was going weird. And Scott, who wasn't my boss, started to notice. And he said, hey, uh, I think you're going out. I think you're going crazy. And I said, yeah, exactly. I, I, you're darn right. I'm going crazy. No, he goes, no, I think you're getting I think you're losing it. And uh, you need to go home right now. And I said, well, I've got all this work to do. And he said, I'll explain to your boss just go home, get some sleep. And that small gesture alone, I thought, well, at least somebody is watching out for me. And that was a very, very small symptom of what his larger MO was. He was always looking out for you. He's always understood where you were in the development chain. And all, and there was a time I remember then many years later when I was part of a kind of group of 12 of people that worked for him there was a, I wouldn't call it an executive council, but it was the people who were direct reports to him. And I looked around the room one day and could just feel it, how loyal they all were to him, how much they loved him. And it wasn't, it wasn't because of what he did for them. It was because of how he felt about them. And with a group like that, there's almost nothing you can't do, you know, because you can call upon them to do unreasonable things with great enthusiasm. And that was very powerful. And then later I had the experience of working for a couple of guys at MC squared, uh, Gary Benson and Rich uh, McAllister, who they were, they were old time handshake guys. You know, if you didn't know that they weren't mobbed up, you would swear they were from the Sopranos. And, but they weren't, you know, they weren't mobbed. They were just, they had that demeanor. Like, um, oh my God, I wish I could remember his name. He was just such a wonderful cat. And he would call me up and he would say, hey, what am I interrupting? And uh, and then he would very sweetly ask you for some, to do something. It was a very masculine, manly guy, but you know, he just loved everybody. It was uh, Rick, Rick Rubio. 
God, what a good dude. Oh, they were all great dudes. I never should have left that company. Anyway, um, you know, I mean, I, uh, anyway, they were, they would have this, uh, this very sort of East Coast blunt way of, if they paid you a compliment, it was, it was, you know, like, hey, thanks, you know, and they were, they were the kind, they were the kinds of guys who, if you did something that they really thought was great, the next thing you know, there's like a, a very fine watch in your mailbox. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, that's the kind of guys they were. And when I say handshake guys, what I mean is they were from a, an industry that depends very heavily on labor and, you know, union guys to fix this or repair that or, you know, and you know how union rules are. They don't want people playing fast and loose with safety. They don't want people playing fast and loose with bringing in some cheap guy to do a job that was otherwise I was supposed to do. You know, because you're dealing with electricians and plumbers and journeyman carpenters. And, you know, if something is done right, it, it, it sends a shockwave through the whole installation. So, you know, they were real strict about who does this and who does that. But there are times when, you know, you're in a you're in a, the Moscone Center or you're in the, the Vegas Convention Center and you need something done and you don't have time to wait around for some guy. Well, if you've got a handshake arrangement with a lot of dudes, they'll go, oh, yeah, God, I'll take care of it. And, you know, they were the gasket between the two hard surfaces of the ownership and the, and the labor. And when the gasket, when everybody looks out for each other, the gasket is very flexible and fluid. You can get a lot done that way. And that's how they were. They were handshake guys and just really admired that quality. See, isn't that though, that is a rule of life. There are rules and then there are rules. And if you're good to people and you care about them, that's not a rule. That's a rule. And um, that the, the definition of givers and takers, the givers, they got a lot of elasticity in that rule. Got coming and going. And they would never dream of firing somebody five days before they go on their retirement, you know, to screw them out of their retirement. That would, that, that would be, that would ruin a lot of relationships. You know, when that got around, all of a sudden that guy isn't, isn't good. He's going to, you're going to wait for that electrician, you know, you're not bringing in anybody to fix that. And that ladder. Yeah. I got to have somebody holding that ladder. So yeah, you just, and ironically enough, Phil, my experience in China, I spent two years in Hong Kong, did a lot of business in China. And in China, they aren't, they don't work off contracts the way we do in the United States. Yes, they have contracts, but really, it's an arrangement. And family means a lot and, and relationships mean a lot. And if you have a relationship, they'll overlook a lot of stuff. But but if you screw a relationship, no contract in the world is going to save you over there. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So you don't, I, I can't say this universally because I didn't have enough experience in China to draw any real conclusions. I will just say that my observation was that relationships were very long-term and you, you would never blow that relationship with doing something stupid that just to chisel somebody out of a nickel. Um, and, and I admired the fact that there were certain things they wouldn't do because it would screw a 30 year relationship. I, I think people, I think people underestimate the power of knowing you can trust somebody. Why, why do we underestimate that though? I mean, if, if you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, I think most people would agree that relationships matter. I mean, my dad's 76 this year and he's like, yeah, I got a guy. I got a guy for this. I got a guy yeah. for that. You know, a lot of times my dad's yeah. the guy because he's super handy, really good guy. But then still people make those short term decisions of, well, hey, I got to make my number by the 15th. So I'm going to lay 11 people off or 1100 people or 11,000 people off. I mean, what's what's changed? Uh, uh, distance is when, when an organization is too big, you can hide behind the organization. Now, uh, let's think of it like this. I want you. I was down in Argentina shooting some commercials when i was down there they were in they we couldn't get argentine pesos in the united states because the currency was in free fall and pretty much the only way you could get business done in argentina was with dollars and uh but if you had dollars man that opened a lot of doors 
Well, we're down there and they're in the middle of this economic free fall and doctors are driving shuttle buses for us. And the finance minister of Argentina put on a wedding for his daughter that cost American uh, a million American dollars in the middle of it. He was putting on a wedding that cost a million dollars in US dollars. I can't believe anybody would be that tone deaf, but he was. And as you can predict, there was a riot at the wedding and they're throwing eggs at the bride. And I'm thinking, you tone deaf son of a bitch, your country is suffering and you are doing this. And, you know, it was so tone deaf that you went, wow, that guy is uh, either mentally ill or he has built himself a world of isolation such that he's not aware that he really isn't aware that people are suffering. I think it might have been the first. Anyway, okay, so what next? I'm watching all of this and I'm thinking, oh my God, how tone deaf can you be? And then it suddenly occurred to me, how far away geographically do you have to be before a million dollar wedding isn't tone deaf? Like, like back in the States, nobody would bat an eye. Uh, you know, and they're suffering all over the world. And the reason is out of sight, out of mind. So when you're in a company that's big enough to where you're just cutting people loose, you know, with no care about their suffering, you know that organization is too big because you don't care because you're you're insulated and you're too distant for those people to be real. Like you wouldn't do it if they were standing right next to you. You'd hope not anyway. But the, well, yeah. And then like you talked about Chainsaw Al, uh, do you know he took a psychopath test and failed? I did not. That's not yeah. surprising though. Yeah. Like he showed of the, of the indicators, I think there's something like 20 indicators. And I think he was, he was very, uh, I think he got like 18 out of 20 or something <laughs> like that. And I, I, let me let me uh, make a disclaimer at this point. I don't know that for certain, so any all of your listeners and viewers have to take that with a grain of salt that I might not be it's right possible. about that. Um, but it, it's worth looking up. The, the fact is that some people who make a habit of and take a certain amount of pleasure in laying people off, they might not be right in the head. Like, yeah, there, there was that woman, what, a couple of weeks ago that... Yeah, was telling her team to suck it up and quit whining, and she got like a fifty million dollar bonus. It's like, yeah, and and did it on Zoom. It's like to your point about distance, though. I, I think you're right, Neil. I think if that those people were in the same room as her, there's no way that she would have said that. I mean, well, to, or or they would have rioted. I mean, I can just have. imagine. She might have. I I've seen that. I I understand the context of her remarks. Um. She's, she doesn't, she's not able to hear herself in that moment. She, if I understand correctly, the context, I think this was what was going on. She was actually saying, you'll get your bonus if we hit this number. Stop focusing on the bonus, focus instead on hitting the number. I think that's what she was saying. But the problem was, again, she was tone deaf to this, to this. Anything you say now, is matter of public record. There are so many devices around just waiting to watch you and catch you in, an, in a vulnerable moment. I have no doubt that if that had not been filmed, you know, the people in the room would would have thought, well, it's not how I feel about it. But I mean, I'll give you an example of a, a kind of remark that was said to me by an upper manager in a company. And I don't think he was quite aware of how this message was being received. I was with a young writer. Two of us were talking to this person. The person said to us, I'm already, I'm already rich. Your job is to make me famous. And I think he thought that was motivating to us. And in, instead, this young writer who was a woman, later, she said, see if you can guess what my mission on earth is right now yeah, bank this guy. <laughs> and i went <laughs> it was in that spirit <laughs> it was like yeah i'll make you famous you mother 
you know, um, you know, because I don't, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced something like this, but oh yeah, I had I had a I had someone who told us how grateful we should be to be working for the company we did in front of everybody as we're laying people off. Oh yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I've heard and that. we were like thirty percent. Most of the staff was twenty to thirty percent underpaid. And mentioned, you know, we should all be grateful. Like, and we weren't, we weren't able to fill. We were laying people off, and we had to fill backfill, obviously, with cheaper people. And he's like, well, I don't know why anybody doesn't want to work here. They should feel empowered that we would be interested in working with them. It's like, yeah. no. Yeah, um, no doubt. In a lot of companies, there is a certain level of fat. Uh, it happens at every company, sure. they say, you know, when they say 20% of the people to come up with 80% of the results and so on. And I think that was, I believe that was what Jack Welch's hypothesis was, is look, I, uh, I just want that 20%. And I want to get rid of the, the fat and the waste and so forth. Okay. I get it. Um, but that does mean that you should be incredibly careful about a whom you hire and b b how you incentivize their performance, because I don't, very, very few people enter a company with the intention of slacking it, you know, and, and just draining the coffers. I, I don't know anybody personally that's ever had that attitude. Um, so uh, uh, so if, if in fact, they're not high performing, chances are there is some oversight in the management and or planning function. And, um, you know, uh, the, the sign of a great coach in whether it's football, basketball, volleyball, whatever it is, is I can take your guys and beat you with your guys, <laughs> right? I, I can beat you with my guys and I can beat you with your guys. And if you look at some of the great, great coaches, um, well, I, I, I'm not sure I actually include Bill Belichick in that, even though he is the dark lord of, of coaches. Um, but I'm thinking more along the lines of who's the coach of the Dallas, uh, I'm, excuse me, the, uh, um, the Spurs. The San Antonio Spurs. Popovich. Popovich. Popovich is one of the great all-time coaches where he can take your guys and beat you with them. And his players, he has relationships with his players that last decades after they are no longer on the team. And his deep concern for the development of those players. I'm not sure there is a luckier thing on earth than to be drafted onto one of his teams. Because... You've entered into a different level of what it means to be coached, and you'll you'll see this periodically. I think uh, I think the coach of the uh, of the Detroit Lions is like that. He cares deeply about his people and wants he wants them to win for reasons that don't actually involve winning. It involves pride. It involves stretching to your potential. It involves bringing something to the city of Detroit. It in it also he feels great loyalty to the ownership of that team because of the license they've given him to do what he needs to do. He, he shows a great appreciation to them. In any case, um, I, I I just I believe that what's what's missing in place, places where they want to just cut off the fat is the the joy to be had from bringing those people up to a higher performance level. Uh, Scott Galloway, who is on the podcast with uh, Kara Swisher called Pivot, and he's got his own podcast called the Prof G Podcast. He's a teacher at NYU. He shows a remarkable combination of learning from many, many years in the business and kind of changing how he operates now compared to how the way he used to operate. When it comes to layoffs, his belief is that you should don't do layoffs in stages. Don't lay off 10% and then lay off another 10%. And the, he just doesn't believe in that. What he believes is do a draconian layoff once. And then with the remainder, build an organization that doesn't require any further layoffs. And there is a sense of shared destiny. And um, Galloway is demonstrating if he's to be believed, and I think he is, if he, if he isn't to be believed, then his performance on the podcast is worthy of an Oscar. But I believe he cares deeply about his, the people in his organization. Uh, and I believe that they repay him with an understanding of what the mission is and absorbing his values in such a way that everybody just automatically agrees without having to come to consensus. 
that, mm. that the power the power of values, the power of, of agreed upon values, is that essentially everybody would make the same decision he would make if he were there to do it. You know, that you operate by real principles. And there are things you won't do, even if there's $500 is dangling out there to snatch up, you won't take it because it's it's dark money or it reflects bad you badly on the the arc of what the company's legacy is and what the company's second and third order effects are in the commons. So so how do we get lucky picking managers? To your point, you, you even said with Galloway there, if he is to be believed, and I'm not suggesting he's not, by the way, but how do we how do we get lucky? How, what do we what do we look for, Neil? Are there signs, signals, or there, is there anything, or do we just get lucky? I think I think people reveal themselves in a million small ways. Like a, uh, do you ever watch that Ted Lasso show on Apple TV? Every time it's on, yeah. Okay, so they they go up. Uh, you know, they've had a very bad season. They lost Zava, you know, their best player, and and yet they have now decided to change the operational strategy of the team to be total football, which relies very heavily on teamwork and not stars. That the philosophy of the team is we are all in this together. We will, we will play as a unit, total football's skill, the, the secret behind total football, as I understand it, is that players can kind of read each other's minds. If you're going to go for it here, I have to backfill for you. We rely on one another to know that if I make this gambit, somebody will fill in behind me so that I am not caught blowing it. Like defenders always have to have somebody that's willing to fill. Okay. So in Ted Lasso, they, they start to show signs of winning because they understand now. And it wasn't one week of working on the tactics of total football. It was three years of thousands of small ways that they can trust one another. And an environment of trust creates an unspoken, uh, a kind of 12th man, if you will, a sort of, there's somebody else here along for the ride. It's, it's, it's when an operation becomes more than the sum of its parts when, yes, there's 11 of us, but there's one more and that's all of us. Now, I don't, I don't pretend to have an answer for like, well, you know, what do we look out for? Except that let's just pretend for a minute that there's a manager out there who's thinking to himself, I don't need the best players. I just need the right players. I don't want standouts and all stars. I want people who are ferociously good at teamwork. And if I get that, I may never need to do a layoff again for the rest of my career because our universal reliance on one another, the topic won't be who do we get rid of? It will be how do we deal with this? How together do we deal with this downturn in the market or this loss of some important element or this, you know, COVID? How do we all survive COVID? We may, in, you know, uh, I was in the live events business. COVID comes along, live events, Vegas, San Francisco. Well, I, they just went to zero for two years. And obviously a company that's on the event in the events business is going to have to lay people off. But you could approach it from the standpoint of this is not a permanent layoff. This is us having to adapt to a strategy of uh, how are we going to survive? You know, you kind of have to go dormant. It's you know, plants will do that. Insects will do that. Look, there is no water. There is no water. So is the plant going to die or is the plant going to go dormant waiting for a return of water? And I, I think a, there needs to be a sort of sense of shared destiny. But, you know, we're, our incentives in our system right now are not built on managers who, um, who build a sense of shared destiny. The incentives are all about advancing in your career and then moving on. Um, it's very much a kind of pirate economy. You know, you uh, for better or worse, I think the incentives are wrong. You know, if you can, my father used to call it catching the bus. He said, uh, you know how some people 
they won't run to catch the bus because there's always another bus coming along. And he goes, well, life isn't like that. There isn't always another bus coming along. Sometimes you have to run to catch the bus so, so that it will get you further faster. And he goes, a good example of catching the bus is getting a college education. Yeah, you're going to have to run. And yeah, you're going to have to give up your dignity at some point. But once you get on that bus or that train, you're going to move further faster. And I think that uh, what, where we're building a culture right now, a business culture, where people are leapfrogging, uh, sometimes on the backs of others, in order to catch the next bus. Like, they're not just running for the bus. They're shoving people out of the way to get to the bus. They're, you know, that was one thing I noticed in China that was just absolutely startling to me. Not in Hong Kong, but in other parts of China where you, you know, instead of a queue to the bus, like you would expect with the Germans or the Dutch or, you know, or the Hong Kong Chinese, it was just a mad dash to get aboard that bus. It was, it was startling to me how they would grab somebody by the hair and yank them back to take their place in the line. I'm going, wow, we're, we're in a new system. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, that is wow. Wow. And well, again, you know, once again man, that's, that's not how it was in Hong Kong. <laughs> no, Sorry. but holy crap. Yeah, we could we could keep going. Man. That is really awesome. So, Neil, we're going to pause here, man. We're going to do this again. Once I love talking to you. I love Are we out of time? You. So, yeah, we're out of time, dude. Oh. So, we are out of time today. So, that's a good thing. So, <laughs> Neil, this is our two <laughs> together which is always a blast so friends yeah, if you're like listening you. if you're watching right check out neil ford at neil ford f-o-a-r-d.com get to know neil more we're gonna do more don't worry neil we'll be Good. back i don't know All what right. we're gonna talk about next time but we'll figure this out but right. thanks again brother you're I'll awesome drop something i'll drop something in your Ooh. notes right now phil just write this yes. down ask me about the arbor day story arbor day story all yeah. right okay, next man. time we'll talk about the arbor day story Cheers. Thank you, Neil.